Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to Tungabi Baptist Church. If I haven't met you, my name's James. I'm the lead pastor here. I've got the joy of opening up God's Word this morning as we, we're just doing a three-week series on money matters. So if you're here for the first time, we're doing a bit of a topical series for over three weeks as we consider what Jesus teaches us about money. And then what we're going to do in, in one more week's time, we're going to then go to the actual Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at chapters one to four over about eight to nine weeks in, in detail. So today we're, we're looking at money and what Jesus has to say about it. Last week we looked about Jesus, about us and our wealth or our money. And today we're going to think a little bit more about, not necessarily saving, but just thinking what else does Jesus say about money for us. So let's pray and let's ask God to help us this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come now to your word and we recognize that money is one of those areas that does pierce the heart. It, cause, it can cause conflict in relationships. It, it can bring tension to our lives. It can bring worry to us and yet at the same time we have we know the reality that we have to use it every day and so father we pray that as we do this series that we'll understand what jesus says about it so that we are free to be people who love to be generous towards your kingdom and your work and we pray this in jesus name amen what what is your ultimate purpose or what are you pursuing right now in this moment now, if you were to use the hashtag blessed life, what, what's that photo that you would put next to your account on Facebook or Instagram? Hashtag blessed life. What would it be that you are ultimately pursuing right now and something that you treasure in this moment? Now, maybe for you, it's hashtag blessed life. For you, you see that the blessed life is one where you delay you have delayed gratification. For you, you're going to hold one job or two jobs for the next 40 years. You're going to work hard. You're going to save hard. And you'll, you don't want to experience everything now, but you want to experience it when you retire. You put extra money into your retirement fund, your super, so that at the end of it, in, in 30, 40 years' time, you'll have just plugged away, and then you'll experience life. And so right now, if you buy a home, you'll buy a smaller home rather than a bigger home. You won't change the carpet. You won't paint the walls. You won't change the kitchen. Because in a way, you want to experience life in 40 years' time. And for you, then you'll be able to say, hashtag blessed life. Or maybe, maybe for you, it's like, oh, no, I'm more of a, you know, instant gratification. You, maybe you're like that. And you're going, actually, no, I want to experience everything now, I want to have those moments in this moment. And so you hold a job for about four years, you get bored, and so you move to the next job. You hold that job for four years, you post again on your Instagram or your Facebook account, thankful for the last four years, I've got a new job, it's going to bring happiness to my life. And four years down the track, you change again. Because you want to just experience the moment. And rather than save, you'd rather spend because you want to experience nice trips overseas. You want to have those moments on, on cruise ship liners where you enjoy going through Germany and Europe. You go, why put that off? I want to have that instant gratification now. And there's a bit of a fear of missing out. And, and so you, you buy homes, but you want to buy a bigger home. You, you'll, you'll, you'll deck it out with new carpet, new tiles, new kitchen. And there's a sense in which that's what life is about for you. And at the same time, like you want to capture those moments of smashed avocado on organically sourced sourdough bread with freshly pressed olive oil whilst drinking a single origin coffee from somewhere in South America. You know, that's the kind of moment you want that now. Hashtag blessed life. What, what is it for you? Are you, are you which, which one are you more like? Or maybe are you more of a spender? Are you more of a saver? Where, where do you fit when it comes to things like that? See, so when it comes to the, the kingdom of God, when Jesus came, he actually flips our worldviews upside down. Last week we saw that when Jesus came to earth, he, he actually flipped what, you know, he flipped the values of this world. He changes our view on marriage, sexuality. He changes our ideas on money and economics. And, and he flips all of that upside down and says, here's what my kingdom looks like. And it's radically different. In fact, he actually flips our idea of what the hashtag blessed life looks like. See, Jesus, he flips it from you being at the center of your world, your little world, and he flips it so that you understand that he's at the center of a much bigger thing of being a part of his kingdom and the endeavors that that brings. And I reckon one of the key values that Jesus flips for us is this value of generosity. He flips it so that we, as being members of his kingdom, it's all about the 
generous life. That we are marked as Christians as being generous in all that we do. Now, last week, I mentioned the quote by C.S. Lewis, that if we take on what Jesus says about money, it is going to feel like everyone thinks you've lost your mind. Here's a quote on the screen. That if you know, that when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. And if we follow Jesus' teaching on money and live out his kingdom values, you're actually, the world's going to think you're crazy. It's going to feel like you are walking against culture and against the grain. And see, they're going to think you've lost your mind. And maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. Maybe you're seeking and you're curious. And maybe the very fact that you're here is because you've seen a neighbor or a friend or a family member whose life, you, you think, yeah, they seem to like they've lost their mind. They seem to live differently. And I want to find out why they live differently. And it's because of the good news of Jesus and the effect that it has on their life. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, I think it is, I think Paul says to the, the, the elders at Ephesus, he says, you know what the blessed life is? It is more blessed to give than to receive. I think at the heart of the kingdom of God is generosity. Why? Well, because God is the great generous one. He's the most generous, isn't he? Like in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, he's the one who created the heavens and the earth. He created waterfalls. He created bird life. He created fish. And we enjoy that. He is the one who gave us those things to, and, and we were created in his image to have dominion over those things. Like God is a generous God. But then we sort of gone, well, no, nah, you're not generous enough, God. We're going to live our own way. And so we sin. And it flipped our idea on generosity. But yet God is still even more generous that in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. You see, God is the most generous God. He sent us the most generous gift of all. He sent us his son to die on the cross for us so that we could have life. And Jesus has a lot to say about money. And see, last week we looked at money and, and, your, and you, and we, so we saw that Jesus, in a way, teaches that, that if you're not willing to leave money behind to follow Jesus, are you really trusting Jesus with your money? We saw that there was a rich young ruler who came up to Jesus, and, what it, and we looked at what does that story reveal about money? And we saw the three things last week. We saw that money can't buy you God, or in another way, said money can't buy you life and happiness. We saw that money... Well, it will expose what you treasure deeply. But at the same time, money has this incredible power to control your everyday life. But at the same time, we saw the beauty and the wonder of who Jesus is. That yes, we have forgiveness. Yes, we have redemption in Jesus. But the gospel message is even bigger than that. Not only do we receive forgiveness and redemption all because of what Christ has done, not because of what you have done. But at the same time, it's a message where we will gain Christ, the all-satisfying treasure. See, the gospel is not a message of survival. It's a message of abundance. And we don't enter this kingdom. If you're here today, you're not going to enter this kingdom by paying God off. You're not going to enter this kingdom by what you do. No, no. How you enter this kingdom is purely through the sacrificial work of Christ on the cross and by having faith in what he has done and what he's achieved rather than what you have achieved. And what you'll find is that the more you explore who Jesus is, you'll find that there's life in that. There's freedom in that, that that will turn your life upside down so that you will want to live generously. And so what we're going to do over the next two weeks is we're sort of going to look a little bit about being people who live generously. And in a way today, I want us to think about living sustainably to live generously. I want us to think a little bit about living sustainably to live generously. Because in a way, we do live in Western Sydney. We live in this 21st century culture we don't live in, in the Middle East. We don't live, and the cultures are very different. But what does it look like for us to live sustainably, to live generously? And why do I say that? Well, you know, in a sense, I want us to think because if you're living in Africa, it's going to be very different to you if you're a Christian living in Watson's Bay with a house looking over the water. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to be different to what you are living in Toon Gabby to someone who's going to find themselves in a small country town. And so what does it mean for us to live generously in those areas, you know, like to, we need to live sustainably in the culture that we're in so that we can live generously. Because, see, Jesus wants us to have eternity in mind when we spend and when we save. See, the way you spend or the way you save reveals a whole lot about you. The way you live should show that you live in a different kingdom. 
And so, you know, tonight, today was going to be more about Jesus and your savings, and, and we'll think a little bit about that, but I'm really not going to talk too much about saving. But here it is. Some of you could be here, and you save, and you're saving like a fool. Right? The way in which you save is you're just saving like that rich fool that Jesus talks about in Luke. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you are saving that kind of way. Or maybe you're actually spending and what you need to hear is you're a fool and you need to actually start to work out how to save some money. You're chasing after everything. Now, while some of you need to hear, you probably need to start saving. Others of you need to hear not to worry so much about saving. I'm not going to really focus too deeply on either of them, but I want us to think about how can we navigate through our culture and so I'm going to ask the question is, well, what do, we know, what do we need to know to live generously? Okay, What do we need to know to live generously? And I think there's three things in this passage we need to know. And the first one is, is that we are all treasure hunters. We, we, we're all treasure hunters. Now, I, like, deep down, like, I love movies about finding treasure. You know, like, I like all the Indiana Jones I like National Treasure 1 and 2. I've watched them twi- well, I've watched 1 and 2 this week with my kids and I've watched them a second time. Uh, you know, I, I just get addicted to shows where they find treasure, like Uncharted. And I think there's Lost City now. I've watched that. And, you know, I, I just like treasure hunting shows. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I, I got hooked on this show on SBS called The Curse of Oak Island. Where, and don't, don't go and watch it, but it's, it's, it's about these, these brothers, Mick and Rick uh, Lagoon, I think it is, who they, they, they buy this island off Canada where they where they think there's this hidden treasure from centuries ago that's buried under the thing. And you watch this show and you think like five years ago it would have ended, but it's gone on episode after season after season after episode after episode. And you watch it and it's so, I get a hook because they're looking for treasure. Their whole life is consumed by looking for this mysterious treasure that's buried somewhere in a cave on that island. Their crew over the years has grown bigger. More people have been caught by it. And what you see as they go seeking for this treasure is that they're not going to give up. And the longer it goes on, the more they become invested in this treasure hunt. And the more that they look, they turn a rock over and, oh, wow, we've found a coin. We're getting closer. They rip a tree out. They dig a garden. And like, oh, we're getting closer. And the more and more they are consumed by seeking this treasure, their life is just driven by it. I've stopped watching it. And I don't know about you, but I just watch it and I think, you're a bunch of idiots. Like, cause let's be real, I don't think they're ever going to find treasure on Oak Island. Like, I just think, Ben, like, do something better with your time. Like, you know, and that's what people who go for treasure are like. It's like, it's a bit, ah, uh, like, come on, you, you, you know better than that. Jesus' answer to us would be actually. You're all treasure hunters. Did you, did you pick that up in verse 18 and 19? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy. But look at verse 20, but store up tr- for yourselves treasure. So what Jesus is saying is, it doesn't matter who you are. If you think you're not a treasure hunter, no, no, no. He says, you're all treasure hunters. You're all pursuing something. Are you going to pursue something that's going to last or something that's going to be short? And at this point in verses 19 to 20, guess who Jesus is talking to? He's talking to disciples of Jesus, followers of him. We're all treasure hunters. Now, a, a show that I've actually recently got hooked on is um, Clark's, I think it's Clark's, Clarkson's Farm on Prime. Um, now, I used to like Top Gear, okay? And so Jeremy Clarkson's a bit of a comedian. And I just come across this and really, I just want to li- relive my childhood now that I'm living in Sydney. And I just love the idea of what he does. And so what Jeremy Clarkson does at the age of 59, I'm just reliving my childhood. He buys a farm. Not that I bought a farm, but you know, like, I want to live that country lifestyle. He buys a farm. He's got no idea how the farm. He buys a tractor, a Lamborghini tractor. You know, he buys machinery. He plants crops. He buys chickens. He buys sheep. And, you know, he, he wants to try farming. And so he wants to grow some crops. And he grows this potato crop. It's incredible. And he gets 16 tonne of potato off this crop. But what do you do with 16 tonne of potato? Well, he wants to sell it. So he puts it in his barn to store it away. And the guy who's the, the agronomist who helps him grow this stuff says, hey, do you realise you can't store that for too long? Oh, yeah, it'll be fine. And so he stores it in his barns. And after two weeks, he goes in there and the potatoes are starting to rot. 16 tonne of it. So he moves it again to store it longer in cold. You know, you take it to a fridge and potatoes will last longer. But that's the thing about potatoes. You can't keep them for 20 years. It's just in possible to do that like you know you're not going to store up potatoes for 40 
million years time in eternity. It's foolish to store that kind of stuff up. Now, Jesus is not saying, hey, don't go and buy clothes. He's not saying don't go and buy food. No, no, he says don't store treasures up in a way that are not going to last. Or what, what I think he's saying is what John Chrysostom said 1,600 years ago. We are only temporary guests on earth. We recognise that the houses in which we live serve only as hostels on the road to eternal life. We do not seek peace or security from material walls around us or the roof above our heads. Rather, we want to surround ourselves with a wall of divine grace. And we look upward to heaven as our roof, and the furniture of our lives should be good works performed in a spirit of love. We are all treasure hunters. So what kind of treasure hunter are you today? What does Jesus mean by storing up treasures in heaven? Now, I think one of the real key things is we learn later on and even other parts, one of the key things is how do you store up treasures that's being generous? Next, we're going to see that about investing in that kind of stuff, investing in the right things that last. So I think generosity is one of those key things he means about storing up treasures in heaven. But I actually think he gives us, the, he gives us a lot more in the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually in the text. Here's some of the things that it means to store up treasures in heaven. You know how you store up treasures in heaven? Is that you pursue being humble and pure in heart. Matthew 5. You're the soul of the earth. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, you resist anger. It's resisting anger. It's being faithful to one's spouse. It's going the extra mile. It's loving your enemies. It's turning the other cheek. It's practicing forgiveness. It's giving to the needy. It's, 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 it's not worrying, worrying about life, but trusting Jesus that God will provide all your needs. That's just a small few of a list that could go on and on about how do you store up treasures in heaven. And verse 33 brings it together. Worry and treasures, they go together. And verse 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what you treasure and that's what you store up and all these things will be given to you as well. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But It is more blessed to give than to receive. What treasure are you pursuing? See, there are things that we convince ourselves that we need, and then there's things that we convince and tell ourselves that we don't need. Now, we can convince that I'm good at this. I can convince myself that I, you know, that, that you, know, you might need a new... Well, actually, I don't convince myself about clothes. I don't go buy too many clothes, but there's technical, you know, like technology... And smart devices, you know, I convince myself that I need those things. But, but maybe you, you, you convince yourself that you need to go buy another dress or another shirt to fill the wardrobe or some more shoes that sit there and fill it up. Or we convince ourselves that I need a third holiday this year overseas to enjoy God's creation. Now, in a sense, they're all good things. You know, Apple phones are good things, clothes are good things, experiencing God's creation are really good things to do. But here's a question. When was the last time you convinced yourself that you needed to practice forgiveness? When was the last time you, you convinced yourself that you need to resist anger? When was the last time that you convinced yourself that you need to be quick to forgive? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so in a sense, what do we need to know to live generously? Well, we need to know that, you know, in a sense, we're all treasure hunters. Now, you may not be tre seeking treasure on Oak Island, but what are you treasuring? What are you going for? Because the reason that we go for the wrong treasure is because of our heart. And for us to live generously, we need to know that, yes, we are all treasure hunters and what captures your heart will control your life. That's our second thing. What captures your heart controls your life. What captures your heart, your eyes will see. Have a look at verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are unhealthy your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Your eyes, where your eyes go, will tell you what your heart is like. What your eyes see is what's important. Now, um, if you don't know, I was, I was a mechanic by trade. So I used to fix cars. And, and really, I was, I was a Nissan kind of guy, Nissan Patrol. Like I, thought, I preferred Nissan over Toyota. And I thought I'd never, ever buy myself a, a Toyota. But there came a few points 
it came at a point in life five years ago, or five or six years ago, I thought, no, we do need to just get another car, and Toyotas are good, and so I thought I'm going to buy a Toyota Prado. And, and, and in my mind, because of our budget at that time with young kids, I thought, I'm, I wanted to buy a 2009 120 series Land Cruiser Prado. That's what I wanted to buy. That was what was on my heart. So I was living at Forbes at the time. So from that point on when I decided, oh, I think we'll buy a 120 series Land Cruiser, Guess what I saw when I went driving? Everywhere, it seemed like everyone in the town of Forbes had a 120 series Land Cruiser, a Prado. When I drove to Sydney, it seemed like everyone in Sydney had a Prado. And just everywhere I went, because it was on my heart, I just happened to see it everywhere. So I rang up my old boss in the other town of the parks and I said, hey, I, I wanna, I've got, this is my budget, I want to buy a 120 series Toyota Prado. And he said to me, hey, James, mate. You know, typical salesman, I've got something better for you. It's a 150 series. And I'm like, no, no, I don't have the money. He said, no, no, it's in your budget. I've got one just for you. So guess what happened for the next month as I went away getting ready to buy this Toyota Prado? I never saw 120 series ever again on the road, but everywhere I went, I felt like everyone owned one of these. I thought everyone in Forbes owns a Toyota 150 series Prado. It's how I was seeing the world because my heart was seeing it. See, the excitement of the possibility of having a 150 series drove what I saw. Actually, my eyes were actually, what I was seeing was really telling me what was going on in my heart at that time. What hope are your eyes set on right now? See, Maybe you're here today and some of you are captured by the need for experience. That even though you don't have the time to do it, even though you know you don't quite have the budget for it, when a friend rings up and says, hey James, you want to come to a concert tonight? You think your FOMO kicks in, I need to have that experience. Or someone rings and says, hey James, I've got cheap accommodation in Thailand and free air tickets. Would you, want, you wouldn't want to miss that experience, but you know the budget doesn't allow it, but you also don't want to miss out. And so you say yes, because you're seeking that moment and that experience. Instant gratification for security and happiness. That, that ends up leaving you with the inability to be generous with your time and your finances. Or, or maybe other for you, maybe, maybe it's the other way. You're so captured by saving for retirement in 30 years' time that you want to become someone who's financially secure so that you don't have to rely on anyone else and you can experience all those things then that it drives you so much that you can't live with generosity now towards God and his people. You know, some of you might be wanting to chase that financial independence that leave you with an inability to be generous. But look what Jesus says in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, in a sense, I suppose serve here, it's, it's, it could, in, in, it's like, what do you look to to worship? Where's your allegiance right now in this moment? What do you find for security and happiness? It tells you. Are you going to choose the heavenly treasure or are you going to choose the earthly treasure? And you can't choose both. Like, for me, I, off, I, I try and convince myself that I can have both. Do you know what I mean? Like, you think, you know, I can be a Christian and I can manage this well. I can, I can manage my money and I can, I can manage, you know, serving a church and doing those things. I feel like I can do that well. But I'm kidding myself. Craig, Craig Blomberg says, against those who might protect, test that they can accumulate both spiritual and earthly treasures Jesus replies that they have two options they must choose between competing loyalties now if the creator of the universe Jesus Christ says you can't do it you've actually got to stop kidding yourself that you can I think this is a very serious statement that we take way too lightly in a Western world as Christians. Because it's so important that we take this seriously because the stakes are way, way, way too high to ignore it. And to ignore how we view money. Paul Tripp says that the treasures of your heart will always shape the way you see. 
Now, if you think money won't become your treasure, I reckon you've already lost the battle because it's always there. It's always there knocking on your door. And so what do we do? How, how do we fix it? What do we do? It's, it's, it's what consumes your mind, shapes what you do. And I think there's these words of, of Paul in Philippians. What captures your mind shapes your life. And, and Paul says this to the church of Philippi. He says, he says to the church, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So, so Paul's saying, hey, let your mind be consumed with what is right. We're, we're, we, we all have the tendency, to be, we're, we're all treasure hunters. What captures your, your, your heart will control your life or, or where your eyes go. But here's the beautiful thing. Jesus' goal isn't your money, it's your heart. He wants your heart. And so therefore, if, if we want to live generously, so live in a sustainable way that lives generously, well, we need to know that we're, like, we're all treasure hunters. What captures your heart will control your life. But then finally, let God worry about tomorrow. To live, to live generously, we let God be concerned. Now, God doesn't worry, but, but let God be concerned about tomorrow. So I wonder whether one of the, one of the reasons that we, the, one of the drivers behind excessive saving is worrying about tomorrow. And I also think one of the driving, one of the drivers behind excessive spending or the FOMO, fear of missing out, is worry. Do you know what I mean? Like with FOMO, if, if you're worried about missing that, that, that holiday that your friend rings you up about and you know you can't do it, and they say, you've got to really come, you FOMO, you have fear of missing out on that experience that you'll never have again. And so it drives you to worry that I've got to make this happen if I don't. Or the drivers to excessive savings, like I, I just don't think I'm going to have enough in retirement. But Jesus, he, he actually, if you, if you go back to Matthew, he, he speaks to us in verses 26 to 29. He, I think he speaks to both the spender and the saver. So there in verse 25, first he says, do not worry. Now, that's actually a command. Don't worry. And look at verse 26. He, I think you know, he's probably talking to some of us who like to save. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than? Look, look, these birds could sow, they could store up, but they don't because God feeds them. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Can, can worrying about your savings, worrying about storing, can that add any to your life? But then what about those who like to spend? And, and why do you worry about, verse 28, about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow and is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? There's a sense in which this is a God of abundance. That those who spend for happiness and those who save for happiness, Jesus says, no, 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 I supply you both security and a future. But why do we worry? Well, I wonder if we worry, one of the reasons we worry is because we become captivated and absorbed in our own concerns. We worry because our ambitions are wrong. See, while ever your ambition is the master of money as your treasure, you will worry and therefore be unable to live generously. And in fact, when you worry about those things, whether it's money, for retirement or in the bank, or whether you worry about clothes and need to experience those, that, that moment or that food and you think, I can't do it. When you worry about those things, you are pursuing the small things. Here's, here's what I'm gonna, so this illustration might work. This just happened. Um, so Roger Federer, you know like Roger Federer, the best tennis player in the world? Well, not him, you know, like he was the best tennis player. And you know that he was going to be the best tennis player ever in the world, right? And his goal was to be number one and win, you know, the most ever Grand Slams. And you know that from the age of one, right? You know that he's going to be that. 
But he grows up and his goal is to win the handball comp at his local primary school. That's it. That's his goal. Now, that's a very small goal for someone who has, could have so much. Like, and and so, so have a look what Jesus is saying here is, is look at there, verse 35. The 35, no, 31, sorry. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Why? Because the pagans, that's the Gentiles, those who aren't followers of Jesus, they run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. See, to worry about money and to worry about clothes that is a very small goal in life in comparison to seeking the kingdom of God. That's a far bigger, more eternal pursuit. Why would you settle and worry about that when you can seek the kingdom? And all these little goals will be given to you as well. Why are you settling and worrying for second best? We seek and we pursue those things because they're our main goals, but yet they're pathetic in comparison to being in the kingdom of God. When we worry and hoard or save stuff beyond the basic sustainable needs, we're, we're, we're going for small goals. Now, here's what I wanted to say for a moment. Jesus isn't saying here, don't save and don't plan, right? Because in, in profit, like, the Bible's actually got plenty of places where it says it's wise to actually think and plan about your future. In, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says, in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, it says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food at harvest. So there's a sense in which there, the Bible it talks about that. Other Proverbs talks about it. You've got in the, in, the, in the account in Genesis of Joseph and Pharaoh, he, he stores for seven years, for seven years of famine. So there is a sense in which there is a biblical principle that it is good to plan and to save. But I won't talk too much more about it, but, but here's what he prohibits, worrying about tomorrow. When we pursue it, we will worry See, there is nothing stopping Christians making sensible plans and taking sensible steps to plan for the future so that they can live generously towards the kingdom of God. And here's a quote by a New Testament scholar on the book of James. And I think it's really helpful for us to understand this. Uh, Craig Blomberg says this, he says, long range planning. So he's going taking you back to the first century when you read the book of James or when you read the New Testament. Long range planning would have stood out as far more unusual in James's world than in ours. The high value we place on such strategizing is decidedly a modern phenomenon not typically practiced even by the minority in the ancient Roman Empire who, who did have surplus savings or investments. The antidote in our modern world is not to try to recreate some mythical ideal past society, which would prove impossible anyway, but to reflect biblically on what, Christians, what Christian planning within a contemporary economical system should look like. What does that mean? You've got to go away and think biblically and wisely as Christians about how much you should save and what you should and what you shouldn't. And I'm not going to tell you how much you should save, right? You've got to go away and think about that. And culturally, where you live, it's Watson's Bay to Toon Gabby to Africa, wherever it may be. But I think in a sense, what you get from Jesus, I think the more, it's like you live in a way that's sustainable so that you can live generously towards the kingdom. You have to think about it. What is your ultimate pursuit in life right now, in this moment? What would you say? What's that hashtag blessed life? What would your Instagram account show? You know, living sustainably to live generously. How do we live generously? Well, we need to know that we're treasure hunters. That what captivates your heart controls your life. And we need to know, let God worry about tomorrow. So how do you view the successful life? What, what, what does it look like? What does a blessed life look like for you? What would it look like to put on your Instagram or Facebook? You know, 
often our world would say, what does a successful life look like? It would look like work, money, retirement, travel the world, pay my home off, give some money to my kids and experience the things around me. And they are all good things. But notice that the kingdom of God has a very different way of accounting for life. It wants to ask us, how you been generous to the kingdom of God? Have you been storing up resisting anger? Have you been storing up being quick to forgive? Seeking peace and mercy? Have you been quick to give generously? To live sustainably, to live generously. Jesus flips it. Um, there was a guy called Sir John Lang, obviously because he got the Sir, he's in England, or he got knighted by the Queen. And Sir John Lang, he was a pivotal figure um, last century in England because he was, the, he was sort of the father of the growing company called Lang Group. It was a construction company. Um, and it was a company that grew to, to see like tens of thousands of people working for his company. Now, so John Lang was actually a Christian. He was a follower of Jesus. And because of what Jesus had done for him and how the kingdom had flipped his values, it came through in his work and how he treated his employees and how he lived his life. One day he's on the construction site and he sees this young guy and he notices that he's unwell and he's tired and exhausted. And he goes over to the young guy and he says, mate, why are you struggling? And, and the guy shares with him and says, well, my, my wife's been sick for the last couple of weeks. I have to get the kids ready for school. I have to do all the house work and so John took that and okay and so John asked him well where do you live mate and 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 John left and he came back a couple of hours to the guy who was working and he said to him you you go home and have two weeks off now when the man got home he hadn't realized that John had already been there and left money for him and his family But at the same time, though, the more you hear about John's life, that he wanted to use his money for God, this is a guy who earned millions of dollars and he lived in a way that by the time he died, he'd given it away so that he only had 371 pounds left in his bank account. You know, in a way, he's living generously for the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus... He, he gave up his heavenly palace, his treasures to come to earth where foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay down his head. So he'd come and he'd, he would come and he would make a way to treasure us. That he knew that he came so that bring light into our darkness so that our hearts could see correctly again. Jesus, who you know, in the garden of Gethsemane, he, 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 he trusts his Father's will and his purpose. And so may we, in, in light of who we are as God's people, let's, let's live sustainably to live generously, to store up treasure in heaven, the far bigger, incredible goals for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we, we actually live in Australia. Father, you've placed us in this century at this time with the money, with pension, with retirement funds. You've, you've, you've placed us in a world where, Father, we have food on our tables, we have clothes on our back. And so, Father, we, we ask that you'll give us great wisdom as followers of Jesus to know how do we live in this world with that kind of resource so that we are building treasures in heaven, not on earth. Lord, may the world see that we are living differently for you. May they come and think that we've lost our mind because of the generosity that has shaped our hearts because of your generosity shown to us in your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we pray this for the sake of your kingdom and your kingdom alone. Amen.